Hello and welcome to Dub at the Cup, Keep Up's daily podcast to keep you abreast of all of the Women's World Cup news. My name is Taryn Heddo. With me today, Teo Pelletzeri and very special guest, Melbourne Victory's Paige Joyce. Paige, welcome. Thanks for having me. Well, we're standing out the front of Melbourne Rectangular Stadium where Tony Gustafsson has just had his match day minus one press conference. Teo, what can you tell us? Well, no definitive word on whether or not Sam Kerr uh, has a certain number of minutes or whether she'll start. Really, about as vague as after we heard from Kerr herself yesterday. So, not a huge amount of progress there. We did hear, though, that Mary Fowler trained and looked good in training. And also, we heard that Ivy Lewick has been ruled out because her concussion symptoms uh, have not subsided to the point where she's available to play. Uh, so, that's the selection issues currently facing the Matildas. As far as how we feel about the team, though, that's what I want to ask you to. Uh, Paige Zoyce, the Matildas are in a situation where they more or less need to win circumstances with Ireland doing us a big favour could get us through with a draw but you've got your ticket how are you feeling about how the Matildas are going to go tomorrow? I am so excited um, I have a lot of faith in them I think they can get the job done and I'm so excited to be able to see it um, right in front of me. As far as the progression of the tournament so far I mean you are an aspiring player who's dreaming of getting into this team one day what's it been like on that roller coaster of emotions as they won the first game but lost the second? Yeah, it's been tricky. I'm definitely like following them on that roller coaster. Um, but yeah, watching them on home soil is just incredible. It's kind of lit my spark even brighter. Um, and it's just so cool to see. I think um, they definitely can get the job done and I'm really excited. Taryn, your thoughts on Tony Gustafsson. Emily Van Egmond was in the presser as well. And we move towards the drop of the first 11. We think Mary Fowler will be back in. But what are you leaning towards as far as the Matildas lineup, at least to start the game against Canada tomorrow? It's very difficult to say, isn't it? Because there's so many variables. Will Sam Kerr start? Tony Gustafsson said that they'll have a meeting tonight with Sam and the physios and the medical staff of the team to determine whether she will be available, how many minutes she'll be able to play. So there's that that comes into play. Obviously, formation comes into play as well. Emily Van Egmond in that press conference, which usually indicates that she will start. Will she start in the second number nine position again? Will Caitlin Ford start beside her? And, well, if Mary Fowler is doing so well at training, then where does Mary Fowler fit? So, so many variables. So could it be Courtney Vine that makes way for Mary Fowler? And then what switches do you think that might need to facilitate if it's Van Egmond stays in the 11 and Fowler comes in for Vine. It could be and I guess in that case Caitlin Ford would push out to the left we'd probably see a 4-3-3 so you'd have Van Egmond there in midfield Fowler as the nine um, and Ford out on the left we'll have to wait and see how that one pans out. One thing that we know almost certainly won't be broken up is that midfield partnership between Katrina Gorey and Kyra Cooney Cross. Now Paige Kyra is part of your generation of young players that are coming through. She's the one that's made the jump into being a starting Matilda. How do you gauge her progress, given that when she was uh, starring in the NTC, you were coming up in the age group underneath. When uh, she was playing NPL, you were pushing and you've been victory teammates as well. What have you made of Kyra Cooney-Cross's progression into the national team as someone who's really almost going step for step following her journey? Yeah, absolutely. Firstly... Um, I'm so happy for her, genuinely. I think she's worked so hard. Um, she's always been a superstar, but I think um, every game she's played, she's grown in confidence. And I think her partnering up with Minnie is just so beneficial for her. And yeah, she's just a pleasure to watch, really. What sort of example does she set to your generation of players? You're only 19, Kyra is what, 21 now? So this is still very much a, a, a new era of Australian players coming through. What's it like to see her setting an example for everyone that wants to you know, fill those shoes one day? Oh, it's really cool. I think it just shows that if you have the hard work and um, if you're good technically, like you never know when your opportunity can come. And I guess she's just taken it with open arms and it's so cool to see. From a pure footballing point of view, what about the combination between her and Gorry? I guess being able to build a midfield combination with your central midfield partner is so important. And we saw how Nigeria were able to close down Katrina Gorry and frustrate in the game that Australia lost. So how do you assess the dynamic between Gorry and Cooney Cross as our midfield partnership at the moment? I quite like them together, to be honest. I think when one kind of gets shut down, the other one kind of shines. So it's a good kind of dynamic. Um, but yeah, I think they have great attacking presence, even like quite low on the field, which is really cool. Um, and yeah, I'm really liking them together at the moment. 
Taryn, uh, Canada, central midfield is actually one of their strengths. They will have a plan for Katrina Gori, much like Nigeria did. How do you think it's going to shape up in that battle for control of general play? Well, we have to win, right? And in the battle of risk versus reward, you have to take the risk to get the bickies in this game if you're Katrina Gori and if you're Kyra Cooney Cross. We've seen several times when they do take on the press, when they beat the press, it gives them so much space to run into. Actually, we saw going a few games back now against France, Caitlin Ford was able to exploit that space a lot. I think that's been one of the big losses with Sam Kerr not playing is not only do we lose Sam Kerr, we also lose Ford in that sort of number 10 space between the defence and midfield. And without her there in that space, Cooney Cross and Gori can both use that to their advantage. I think in a must-win game, they've got to try and take that press on more rather than reverting to the long diagonal. Now, Alex Chidiak, the game changer, as she's been dubbed, I specifically asked in the press conference, just as I wanted to just absolutely ask, what does it take for her to start? I got an answer that didn't really indicate she's going to start. She's going to be coming off the bench at best. Fair enough. The coach's decision. So, Paige, um, how, do you, how do you see how your Melbourne Victory teammate, Alex Chidiak, has been used by the national team as far as this wider role that she's playing? How, how does that contrast with the role that she's had in Melbourne Victory the last two seasons where you've been one of her midfield teammates? Well, yeah, obviously she played just about every game for us, so it's hard to see her on the bench for the Matildas. Um, but I guess very talented squad. I would love to see her to get more minutes because I think she's absolutely phenomenal. Um, but I guess, as we saw in the last game, she doesn't need that much time to create um, such great opportunities. So I guess whatever time she gets, she'll make the most of it. Now, uh, when you're a bench player waiting for your opportunity, it can be tough. We've seen both the Sydney FC coach Ante Juric and the Juventus coach Joe Montemuro speak in their various media roles about how Chidiak should be considered to start or should be subbed on earlier and, and play more minutes. Put that aside, from a mental point of view, how do you think Alex Chidiak would be feeling emotionally about being one of the main players talked about in this tournament <laughs> and sort of being hailed as a saviour that could come and save our World Cup campaign off the bench? What sort of personality is she and how do you think she'll be dealing with that level of scrutiny? Um, yeah, she's a very humble person, first of all, so she doesn't really get caught up with all the media and all the talk, um, which is like a good quality to have, I guess. Um, but yeah, she's very humble, I think. She knows um, her job and... Yeah, she'll get it done. She almost scored against Nigeria, Taryn. So uh, let, let's talk about our subs. What minute, if Kerr doesn't start, do we see Kerr? And do we see Alex Chidiak at all? And if so, what sort of circumstances do you think we might need to bring Chidiak on? It's got to depend on game state, doesn't it? And, you know, you say, yes, we are kind of hyping up Alex Chidiak a lot and well-deserved. Let's not forget it was her first ever World Cup appearance against Nigeria. Her first ever. You know, we've known about Alice Chidiak for such a long time in the A-Leagues. We know how incredible she is. But that's, that's an amazing achievement, first up, for her to just get on the pitch at a World Cup. Should have been more, you know, according to a lot of people who watch the league. I'm sure according to her Melbourne Victory teammates as well. Look... In terms of Kerr, I, I think it depends on game state. I mean, ideally, we would have been walking into this game against Canada with six points, not needing to risk her. That would have been the ideal scenario, right? Of course, that's not the situation. Now, there's two sort of ways of looking at it. You can look at it like it's a cricket game, like it's a batting order. You put your best players up first, you start her, even if she can only play 30, 45 minutes, you want to get the early goal, you want to get the advantage, and then maybe you can bring on a defender, go to a back five and try and shut up shop. The other way to look at it is if you can keep the score at nil all to the 60, 65, 70 minute mark, and if she can only have 20, 30 minutes in her legs, what a weapon to bring on at that stage of the game. Even better if we can nick a goal without her on the pitch. So two ways of looking at it. For me personally, I think I'd, I would lean towards her starting, even if it is only for a half. I think if Canada take the lead, it will be very difficult for us to get it back, even with her on the pitch, and we can kind of reassess game state as we go, if we go out with our best 11. All right, well, Paige, um, you're you know, only early in your career, games being televised, you've gone to a Youth World Cup. Can you comprehend that the entire country is talking about Sam Kerr's calf? And <laughs> like, the, uh, you, know, you are an aspiring professional athlete, you're in a professional environment at Melbourne Victory. Can you imagine what it would be like to have the entire country speculating about whether or not your calf is good to go? <laughs> yeah, that would be pretty crazy, pretty funny as well. But yeah, I think she's taking it like a champ and hopefully we see her tomorrow night.
Give us your expectations and your hopes for what you want to see at Amy Park. It's going to be loud. It's obviously going to be a very biased, parochial Australian crowd, a respectful crowd. I mean, um, I think uh, Vince Regari from the City Morning Herald actually asked Sam Kerr if uh, the fans should, should boo the national anthem, and, and Sam Kerr said, no, please don't do that. But um, <laughs> what are your expectations for tomorrow night? Yeah, you can make a prediction if you want, but what are you hoping to see and what do you think we'll see? Okay, well, I think it's going to be very fiery. I think we're going to come out all guns blazing. Our never say die mentality will be out there to show. Um, I think and I hope it'll be full of goals and I'm thinking maybe 3-1. Taryn, what do you think we'll see and what are your predictions for what will happen tomorrow night for the Matildas? I'm so biased. Five nil Australia. We're going to smash them. It's going to be a wonderful game. No, look, I think it's it, it'll be tight. It'll be nervy. Canada are going to sit deep. They know they only need a draw. Uh, we are the team that needs to accelerate and get the win and get the goals. So it's going to be tight. I think it all depends on what happens in the first half. If we can get a breakthrough early, we're a chance. All right. Earlier today on uh, the World Cup slate, it was Group A. Uh, in the end, Switzerland go through top and Norway go through second. Norway smashing the Philippines 6-0. So uh, the fairy tale very much uh, came to an end for the Philippines. However, a nil-all draw was an agonising way for New Zealand to go out. Now, your teammate and friend Claudia Bunge from Melbourne Victory came off the bench for New Zealand, but they just couldn't find a goal. No, no. She was phenomenal, though, when she came on. I thought she was so good back there, and I was praying that she was going to get her head on a set piece, but it just didn't come. Always tough when a host nation goes out, but New Zealand, they still won their first game. They picked up four points in the group. They will be left to rue the loss to the Philippines, but how do you think the New Zealanders will be left feeling about the tournament that they had? I think they should be so proud of themselves. I think that opening game was just awesome to see. It even brought me to tears when the final whistle blew, so yeah. Definitely um, not something to take lightly. I think they should be very happy with themselves. You've played against a lot of those Kiwi players in the A-League women's. Um, Hannah Wilkinson, Katie Bowen, India Page Riley, of course, Claudia Bunge is your teammate. Like, what do you think New Zealand football will get out of this? They've got the Wellington Phoenix coming back. They're building, slowly getting stronger. Um, what do you think it'll do for New Zealand going forward, and especially also for the Phoenix in the A-League women's? Yeah, I think it'll give them a lot more confidence. I think they definitely are building, like you said. and. Yeah, even the Knicks were better this season, so I think um, they should have a lot of confidence as well. Taryn, it's over for New Zealand, it's over for the Philippines. Your thoughts on how Group A shook out today? Yeah, it was, you know, a bad day for the underdogs, shall we say. Uh, Norway finally came to life, that 6-0 victory, just astonishing, and a hat-trick as well to Sophie Roman Hogg. Well deserved, that first goal. A volley, an absolute banger. Uh, you know, just absolutely smashed the Philippines, unfortunately for them. And the fairy tale does come to an end, as you say, Teo. For New Zealand, well, I think Switzerland went in at half time, and I think they were told Norway are 3 0 up, we can get away with a draw here. If we don't get a draw, we're out. And from then on, they defended for their lives. New Zealand knew they had to get the win. And gosh, they came so close in the first half. Liv Chance hit the bar, uh, and then at the end, so many set pieces. It's actually something I wanted to ask you about, Paige, because Vic Essen, New Zealand's goalkeeper, got her head to the ball from a free kick in stoppage time. Is this something that at a professional level you ever practice? Would you ever think, you know, oh, we might need the goalkeeper to go up in this scenario? You know, is Casey Dumont practicing headers at training? Not that I've seen, no, but she does practice penalties and we saw that. Um, but yeah, honestly, Vic Essen got a real good head to that one. I thought it was going in. She got a lot of power, but who knows? Maybe she does practice those. It would have been the dream, wouldn't it? <laughs> the absolute fairy tale, but unfortunately not to be for New Zealand. Just quickly, a Norway back, or was that them dispatching a Philippines team with a scoreline that perhaps would stack up to the relative ability of the players in the world rankings? I think that Norway will think they are back, and confidence and momentum can do wonders at a World Cup. Great story earlier in the day in Adelaide. Morocco winning for the first time in a World Cup game with their first ever goal scored at a World Cup game, 1-0 against South Korea. Uh, depending on the outcome of Germany versus uh, Colombia, which is going on right now, it's probably the end of the road for South Korea. Tarrant, very disappointing tournament from them. Fantastic moment for Morocco. Wonderful moment for Morocco. In the sixth minute, Ibtissam Dredi, a diving header. Uh, at the back post, gets the goal for Morocco, and from then they held on. Korea, though, didn't look that threatening. Very, very dangerous. Their coach, Colin Bell, after the game, 
said that you know they'd saved their worst two performances in his tenure for the two World Cup games, which is incredibly disappointing for him and, and for Korea. Uh, we mentioned last time on this very podcast, Teo, Korea seems to be a team that can only really function out of possession. They really struggle to function when they need to score, when they need to push things. We saw how well they can function out of possession against Australia at the Asia Cup not too long ago. When they have to force the issue, they've struggled to do it. So very, very disappointing for them. And uh, I can tell you that uh, we are recording during the late game where Colombia lead Germany 1-0. This is not a drill. Uh, make sure you keep following Keep Up for coverage of that game and the full-time result. Let's get some rapid-fire predictions for the other games tomorrow because, yes, uh, Australia is our focus, but the other group game, Ireland could do Australia a massive favour if they win by the right scoreline to allow the Matildas to progress with a draw. Uh, Paige, what are your thoughts on Ireland against Nigeria? Who do you think will win and why? I love an underdog, so I'm going to go Ireland. Katie McCabe, I think she's going to unleash one. Yeah. Taryn? Pressure's off Ireland and pressure is all on Nigeria and that could make a huge, huge difference. Again, I'm being so parochial tonight. Let's go 3-0 Ireland. <laughs> okay, uh, now the other group it has already been decided who's going through, but who's top could be absolutely crucial. Japan against Spain. Uh, if it's a draw, Spain finished top. Uh, Taryn, did Japan beat Spain and leapfrog them for top spot in the group or do you see it going a different way? I think Spain will be too strong in saying that. I think this could be the game of the day um, because both teams have played so well so far in this tournament. They both play a technical style of football that we love to see. So, look, I think Spain will be a little bit too strong, but it'll be a great game. Paige, tell us what you've liked about Spain and in this tournament so far, and do you think they'll make it three wins from three? I think they will. I think the way they move the ball and their decision-making is really good to see, and I think, yeah, they'll get over Japan. And the other game in that group is Costa Rica taking on Zambia. Uh, neither team wants to go home without a win. Neither team wants to go home without a goal. Taryn, who uh, leaves more satisfied at the end of their World Cup? I think there'll be a lot of goals in this game. I'm backing Zambia, 3-2. Paige, you went to Costa Rica with the under-20s. Uh, what would it mean for that country if the Costa Rica senior team was to win this game? Oh, I think it'd be really special for them. I think one of the girls actually versed. Um, is playing in the senior team as well, so I think it'll mean a lot to them and, yeah, excited to see what they can do. All right, so those are the other games coming up tomorrow. Paige, just to finish, uh, you will be back at Melbourne Victory this summer in the Liberty A-League, which is very exciting for you. Uh, where, how long until pre-season? You're playing NPL with the Bullion Lions at the moment, so uh, what are your thoughts on how, when we, it's the middle of winter, it feels like a long time away until the A-League comes back, but just give us an update on how you're tracking and how you're feeling about the next summer in prospect, given that Victory made the pointy end of the season once again, but just fell short of getting that three-peat of championships. I'm so excited. I think we start pre-season in a couple of weeks and I just cannot wait. Um, I love being at Melbourne Victory. I love my friends there. I love the challenge and yeah, I'm excited to see what we can do this season and I'm really passionate to see if we can make it all the way. And I'm not going to stitch you up and ask who's come and who's gone and transfers and what have you, but we know that you're going to be there and that's important. Obviously, you must be thrilled also that you've got Jeff Hopkins again as your coach and that's going to allow you to continue your development as a, a player in that Victory team. Yeah, definitely. Um, I've been under Jeff for maybe five or six years now, so I think you know we've built a really great relationship and I'm lucky to have a mentor like him. Well, good luck uh, for Melbourne Victory in the coming Liberty A-League season. Paige Zoyce, you've been a great guest. Thank you for joining us. I know that you, like everyone, is very nervous about the Matildas, but you've got your ticket, you'll be there, and so enjoy the game and thank you for joining us on Dub at the Cup. Thanks for having me. And uh, we will have uh, full reaction live after the game Tomorrow night, uh, Taryn, where can people find out more about Keep Up's Women's World Cup coverage? Well, Teo, you can follow us on all social media platforms to find out the very latest on the Women's World Cup. So that's your Facebook, your Twitter, your Instagram, whatever you like. Also, make sure that you follow the podcast wherever you get your podcast, whether that be Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or on our Keep Up YouTube channel. It has been a pleasure having your company this evening. My name is Taryn Hedo. This has been Dub at the Cup, and goodbye.